investigation context. Uh, so there are two cases, <laughs> German institutions over a uh, forced sale of art, one against a Hungarian government, Hungarian property that they were responsible. Somebody's got a lot of background noise. Yeah, so I'm gonna. Esther? <laughs> Is everybody, yeah, it's great. Great. The, these two cases are, are brought under the same provision of the Foreign Sovereign Immunity mm -hmm. Act what's called the expropriation exception. And that the FSIA says that foreign sovereigns are immune from suit in US court, except for a number of specific provisions. And one of them is when they're sued for takings of property in violation of international law. And that's why in these cases, we wind up uh, having causes of action, the plaintiffs wind up having causes of action for the taking of, the pro of their property, but not for the killing of their family members because of the language of the FSIA. Uh, in, the, in both cases, as you'll hear in more detail from members of our team, there are issues related to whether the United States ought to hear these cases in, in US federal court or whether we ought to defer to Hungarian or German uh, domestic processes out of a concern for international comedy. And in both cases, there are discussions over whether there's something as a matter of international law or comedy or policy uh, or the text and kind of original understanding of the FSIA that makes the fact that the plaintiffs were, uh, according to the defendants, nationals of the countries that took the property from them, uh, that, whether that makes it problematic to hear the suits in US court. And uh, so that's the general issues presented in the two cases. It's of course crucial to remember, and you'll hear these coming through, that these are fundamentally genocide cases. The takings of context. And that's one of the things that we want to really bring to the discussion. There are claims in both the respondent uh, sorry, but the petitioner's brief in the German case and a couple of the amicus briefs that because these are takings of property, they're not properly acts of genocide. It's a misconstrual of genocide law in general, as well as of, uh, US federal law about the Holocaust. The last thing I wanna talk to before throwing to, uh, to talk to you about before throwing to some of the members of our team in terms of the litigation context is some of the other amicus briefs. Uh, and we see the United States supporting uh, immunity in its amicus brief, the federal government, out of what I think is a misplaced concern that this is similar to the alien tort statute and might, uh, might open the floodgates to a large amount of litigation, both here and abroad against various foreign sovereigns, and a misunderstanding of the different nature of genocide compared to other international violations. And I think both those things uh, fit well with the themes that we were trying to assess and focus on uh, and assist the court in evaluating in our brief. And you also saw a couple of really great other briefs uh, on both sides, but I'd, I'd particularly single out as, as valuable to us, uh, one brief from a number of Holocaust and Nuremberg historians uh, filed in the Germany case that really helps understand the uh, importance and horror of the persecution that had already happened at the time that taking occurred. With that uh, said, I think I'm, I'm gonna throw it to our team members and stop talking myself. And uh, Ariel, I think is gonna talk a bit about the facts of the Hungary case and what we were really dealing with there. Thank you, Arthur. And if I could just uh, make one more reminder to everyone, please keep yourselves on mute while we're talking, I'd appreciate it. <laughs> Uh, and let me begin also just with a, a personal note that writing this amicus brief was very much a personal endeavor as the descendants of Holocaust survivors and having grown up, and I think I speak for all the members of our team when I say this, you know, having grown up hearing uh, firsthand accounts of the atrocities that were committed uh, during the Holocaust and uh, understanding and and bearing in many ways the impact and the loss to our community of what happened during the Holocaust. And that was, I think, 
one of the main motivators in our brief that we wanted to remind the court of how significant and how personal this genocide was. And so the case, uh, Hungary versus Simon, which is before the Supreme Court, was first brought by a group of 14 plaintiffs who are Hungarian Holocaust survivors and their heirs, and it was brought in the United States District Court for the District of Columbia in 2010 against the Hungarian government and the Hungarian National Railway Company. And they were seeking to bring a suit on behalf of a class of Hungarian Holocaust victims to get compensation for uh, the property that was taken from them during the Holocaust. And uh, before the war, there were about 800,000 Jews living in Hungary. And the DC Circuit Court of Appeals, I think very poignantly and correctly observed when it was ruling on this case, that nowhere was the Holocaust executed with such speed and ferocity as it was in Hungary. So Hungary allied itself with the Nazi uh, government. Uh, but in March of 1944, Germany occupied Hungary. And over a two month period between May of 1944 and July of that same year, over 135 trains traveled from Hungary to Auschwitz, packed with uh, 437,000 Jews. And during that two month time period, nearly 300,000 Jews were killed and Jews from Hungary. And during the Holocaust, the entirety of the Holocaust, more than two thirds of Hungarians, Jewish, of Hungary's Jewish community was decimated. So even before the German occupation in March of 1944, Hungary had taken many steps to de facto strip Hungarian Jews of their Hungarian citizenship. And so they passed laws that, for example, precluded Hungarian Jews from voting or being elected to public office, from being employees or civil servants uh, or school teachers, from uh, serving in the military. And most importantly, I think for, for the purposes of our brief, Hungary had passed laws that precluded Hungarian Jews from owning property or acquiring title to lands or other immovable property. So that by the time of the actual, that the actual killings took place, uh, Hungarian Jews were subject to complete forfeiture of all of their assets. They were subject to forced labor inside and outside Hungary. And this, as we argue in our briefs, was integral to the genocide that was committed against Hungarian Jews. With that, I'm going to turn it to my colleague, uh, Rob, to talk about uh, the Germany case. All right, so I've got quite a lot of information to throw at you. Um, let's just take it. So on this number 19351, which is before the uh, which is before the Supreme Court, is um, the Federal Republic of Germany et al. versus Alan Fipp et al. And we'll deal with who those et al.s are. Um, I'd like to thank all the members of the brief, obviously Arthur for heading this up, Stephen Greenwald, Alicia Gresh, Rhonda Lees, Ariel Glasner, uh, David Jacobson from Blank Rome. Um, they're all part of this. So this case was originally brought by Alan Phillip, Gerald Stiebel and Jed Liebers and they're heirs of the consortium. Um, and we'll deal with who the consortium are in due course versus the, the Federal Republic of Germany and Stiftung Preussischer Kulturbeitz, uh, which is the Prussian C Cultural Heritage Foundation known as the SPK, because I'm not gonna say that again in future. And their job it is to acquire and protect the cultural legacy of the former state of Prussia. Now, the under facts uh, or allegations in this case are very interesting. This case is uniquely interesting because it doesn't involve, as one would imagine, the classic 
taking, if there can be one, where stormtroopers come into a wealthy Jewish Berlin apartment and under the direction of a shiny booted Ubergruppenführer, uh, the art is systematically stolen and catalogued. This involves a period of history that preceded such brazen daylight robbery and to place it into its correct historical setting, this was in the dawning of the denaturing of Jews of all of their rights towards the eventual end of dehumanization and destruction at the end. So I give a slight amount of background to the art itself that we're talking about. In 1920, We've lost your audio or I have. Somebody muted me. <laughs> they don't like what I'm saying, <laughs> all right? To give a slight amount of background to the art itself, in 1929, three Frankfurt-based firms owned by Jewish art dealers, Sammy Rosenberg, Isaac Rosenbaum, Julius Falk Goldschmidt and Zacharias Hackenbroch joined together to form a consortium and they purchased a unique collection of 82 pieces of 18 to, uh, no, of 11th to 15th century medieval relics and ecclesiastical art called the Welfenschatz or the Guelph treasure from the Duke of Brunswick and were housed for generations, had been housed for generations at Brunswick Cathedral. We're talking about things like bits of fingers of saints that are housed in these beautiful um, uh, gold, golden boxes, etc., etc. After displaying the wealth and chats throughout Europe and the United States and selling about 40 pieces to various museum and collection, uh, collectors, the consortium placed the remaining about 40 pieces of the collection into storage in, in Amsterdam. But these 40 pieces reflected 80% of the collection's value. The historical context is this, that after the Enabling Act of 1933, which allowed the passing of laws by the Nazi government by decree, a whole host of laws came in where all non-Aryans were dismissed from holding jobs. And there was a general boycott of all Jewish owned businesses. Jews were prohibited from owning land, et cetera, et cetera. But one important, one important aspect of the membership in the Reich Chamber of Culture was prohibited, which meant that Jews could not hold jobs in radio, in theaters or sell paintings or sculptures. So, and then in 1935, as we know, the Reichstag, uh, the Reichstag uh, adopted the Nuremberg laws, which declared that Jews could no longer be citizens of Germany. So following two years of this persecution and a physical peril to themselves and their family members, the treasure was purchased by Wilhelm Stuckart, and his history is fascinating generally, but he was a lawyer of the Reich Ministry of Interior Division I, which dealt with the state of Prussia, and he was buying it at the direction of Hermann Goering, at that point for 4.25 million Reichmarks, Reichsmarks, which was barely 35% of its actual value. At that time, and according to the briefs, um, Goering seldom seized uh, art that he desired, preferring this bizarre pretense of negotiations and purchase from counterparties who had little or no ability to push back without risking their property or their lives. Um, showing the value of the wealth and Schatz was then shipped from Amsterdam to Berlin, where Goering presented it to Adolf Hitler as a surprise gift. Um, all but one of the consortium members then fled the country. One of the, remember, the remaining members died. They believe that he was dragged to his death through the streets of Frankfurt by a Nazi mob. After the war, the wealth and Schatz was, Schatz was seized by US troops and turned over to the SPK, which is a semi-private foundation that, the German, uh, the, uh, that was formed uh, for the purposes. The SPK has now been um, uh, has now housed everything in the Bodhi Museum in Berlin. So the arguments against this, the, the, uh, this case was originally brought, or the matter was originally brought before the German Advisory Commission for the return of cultural property seized as a result of Nazi persecution, especially Jewish property, a nice short name that they like in Germany, which was created pursuant to the Washington Conference Principles on Nazi Confiscated Art. And in 2014, they held that the wealth and chats was not a compulsory sale due to persecution and refused to recommend its return. The main three points that they said, that there was no indication that the art dealers and their business partners were pressured during negotiations, 
the world was an economic crisis in 1934 and 1935, and the, the sides agreed on the purchase price. Um, the art dealers use the proceeds primarily to repay the financial contribution of their business partners. And there was no evidence that the business partners were not free to dispose of the proceeds. The heirs filed suit in, in the District Court of, of in District of Columbia, asserting a load of uh, common law causes, seeking either the return of the wealth and shacks and or $250 million. Um, Germany moved to, dis uh, to dismiss, saying that it enjoyed immunity from suit, as Arthur said, under the FSIA, and that international comity required the court to decline that. Um, the district court re, uh, rejected all, all, all of their arguments, denied the motion to dismiss. This went up to um, the, uh, the, uh, the DC Circuit Court of Appeal, where on a July 10th, 2018 judgment, if anybody wants a reference, 894 F3D 406 DC Circuit 2018, um, before Tatel, Griffith and Wilkins. Um, the opinion for the court filed by Circuit Judge Tatel um, rejected many of the arguments um, concerning a the nature of forcible deprivation, um, also what constitutes a genocidal taking and not a genocidal taking, and also rejected the floodgates argument. Um, uh, I could go into the intimates of the arguments here, but I think it's best left to those people that, de uh, that dealt with those sides at a brief. An interesting aside to this, just to finish off, uh, the German government definitely wants to maintain uh, control over the collection, took action in 2015 to make sure it isn't going anywhere. The state of Berlin has designated the Welfenschatz as a cultural property of national significance um, and passed an act to stop it for, uh, from removing the pieces from Germany, even for exhibition purposes. Um, it would require permission of the German federal government permission for the culture and media. So it's definitely something uh, that Germany wants to keep in their possession um, and views at a very high value. Um, I hope you didn't mind my rapid speaking. Hey. Rhonda, you ready to go? I think I am. It's hard to follow Rob even if it weren't with that baritone um, British voice, but let's see what I can do. So um, Rob did a great job of describing the history of this particular case. I'm going to talk a little bit about what the German state was like before and after this taking. So in 1920, the Nazi, it was only a party then under Hitler, made very clear that only a national comrade can be a citizen. Only those who have German blood, regardless of faith, can be a citizen. Hence, no Jew can be a citizen. This was in the dark ages of 1920. But when the Nazis came to power, as Rob indicated, in 1933, which is the date that the United States and other international entities have set as the beginning of the Holocaust, they put this into place. So to have Germany argue, wait a second, this was a domestic taking. This was something happened to our own people, therefore it should be argued in Germany, is something that we are very strongly disagreeing with. So we've talked a little bit about genocide. Genocide has a number of components. Why we feel that these cases are so important and so and exemplify so strongly what goes on is that the systematic taking of property, of taking the money, the possessions, the artwork of the Jews was not just an incidental element of the Holocaust. It was in fact a major element to it. It was not just the hatred of the Jews and the wishing to annihilate them, but to take their property. Um, one of the things that is so interesting in the change from the Weimar Republic, which was pre-1933, to what happened afterwards, were Jews had taken advantage in a good way of the freedom that they enjoyed under the Weimar Republic to become, you know, 
I don't want to say um, like independent professions. There were a lot of lawyers. There were a lot of people who were in the arts. And so this newfound freedom was fairly quickly squelched. Um, so the, by the time of the taking, which was in 35, the government, had, the Nazis had total power. As Rob indicated, um, they not only owned the different houses of parliament, but those houses of parliament had um, different stormtroopers and different paramilitary, um, we could say thugs, but organized thuggery at their disposal. So this was not simply that they owned the laws. Um, there is a book which I would show you, but then I would have to lower my um, camera. So I apologize. Um, it's called Lawyers Without Rights. And it was published by Bill Choike, who's on the call, and the American Bar Association that details the systematic removal of Jews from the legal profession very early on. This was part of the different, the 400 different local and national laws in Germany that, as we are describing, sought to remove Jews not only from um, civil and other uh, professions, but from the economic um, sphere of Germany to begin with. Alyssa, did you have more to add? Uh, well, I also uh, would like to bring up the um, argument of constructive uh, de denationalization within the Hungary context. Um, it's very closely intertwined with um, you know the facts of, of Germany because um, the Jews in Hung uh, the Hungarian government really replicated the system that had been already tested in other Axis countries, namely the, the German model where they ousted the Jews from economic life, robbed them of their property, confiscated their homes, um, limited their freedom in several ways. Um, there are plenty of egregious examples um, of uh, the, what the Hung Hungarian government did to their Jews. Um, and actually in 2011, um, in uh, the Zeppel versus Republic of Hungary, the uh, DC District Court um, actually already decided that um, in that in this case, um, uh, sorry, one second, that um, Hungarian Jews had already been de facto stripped of their citizenship rights. So this isn't even really a new issue in the uh, Hungarian case. Um, and by 1944, Hungarian law precluded Jews from acquiring Hungarian citizenship by marriage, naturalization, voting, being elected to public office, being employed as civil servants, very similar to the um, situation with Germany. Um, and um, just kind of one note from a more legal perspective, you know, the both defendants in um, in the Germany and the Hung Hungary cases do discuss constructive denationalization, though in the German context, it's discussed more in terms of the, um, the idea of international takings in order for this to fall under the, uh, in the ex expropriation exception of the Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act. Whereas in the Hungarian um, argument, the constructive nationalization is discussed more in terms of uh, you know support for their argument of comedy, so um, I think that you know the point is uh, that I think we can all agree that Jews in Germany and Hungary, respectively, were denationalized to the point where to subject them to certain laws and not others would be completely inconsistent, and you know Germany. And or Hungary don't get the benefit of you know, saying that they're uh, they're nationalists in some circumstances where it benefits them, and then not in others where it doesn't. I was wondering if I could make one um, additional comment about that. Uh, obviously, uh, you can tell what Alyssa and I worked on. Um, Dachau, the concentration had already been um, start was already started in 1933. So the specter of that, even though the number of people who were actually tortured and executed in there was quite small based on what happened in the rest of the Holocaust, that had already started. So the specter of that, plus all the other rights that were taken away from the Jews is definitely an important element of what was happening um, regarding the sale at this time. 
right. And I could take it away, David. David is another, uh, David Jacobson also worked with us and he is a colleague of Ariel Glassner's at uh, Blank Rome. So David, please uh, take the discussion away. Sorry if we uh, spoke for too long. Thanks, Alyssa. Um, can everyone hear me okay, Alyssa? Yeah. Okay. Um, so um, I'm going to talk briefly about one of the sort of two major legal issues that are getting decided in these cases before the Supreme Court. Um, our, next, uh, our next speaker, Steve, is going to be speaking about comedy, um, which is an international, which is sort of a doctrine of, of, of grace um, to foreign sovereigns, whereby you accord deference to their own processes domestically and their ability to um, basically resolve litigation in their own courts that you, that you, a foreign country, ought to defer to them because they have a greater interest. And Steve's gonna talk about that. Um, the question that I'm talking about is about the, the Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act. Um, it, is a, it was a statute that was enacted in 1976 by Congress. And the purpose was really to codify existing practices. Now, um, dating back to the 19th century and earlier, um, generally the, um, the doctrine that was sort of universally applied was absolute sovereign immunity. Meaning that if a country, if a, if a foreign state is sued in your courts, your courts, you being some other state, um, they are off the hook. They immediately, you cannot have them sitting as a defendant in your courts um, because that would violate their sovereignty. Um, now, in the 20th century, particularly around the middle of the 20th century, that underwent some significant changes, particularly as um, international business really picked up and there were private citizens doing business in foreign countries, right? And for instance, you know, an American citizen might own a business in Cuba at some point, and then that business gets expropriated. And so it stopped being so satisfactory to consider the principle to be absolute sovereign immunity because um, the rights of private citizens were being violated by foreign sovereigns and they really were denied recourse. And so what was adopted instead was something called the restrictive theory of sovereign immunity. And how that works is that basically the analysis is, is that if a foreign state has acted in some way to violate the rights of some, you know, some person, um, but has done so in, a, in almost a capacity as a commercial actor rather than as a sovereign actor, then that state is no longer entitled to immunity. And that was the general concept was that if a state is out there in the marketplace, um, taking things from people, uh, you know, in, engaging in transactions that may be oppressive, then the state cannot be off the hook in foreign courts for suits arising from that type of conduct. Um, now, um, that concept of restrictive sovereign immunity was sort of bubbling around in the 1940s. And this was the same time that um, the State Department was evaluating how to deal with Holocaust restitution claims. And so in the late, in the late 1940s, there was a case in, in, in federal court in New York um, called, called Bernstein. And in Bernstein, um, a, a Dutch company um, with the cooperation of Nazi officials um, took shares of a German company from, a, from Jews and essentially took those shares for themselves. And the, the owners after the war brought suit in New York and the court said, look, like you're asking us to, you're not suing Germany, but you're asking us to pass judgment on the acts of a sovereign government during the, during the war um, based on principles of sovereign immunity. We can't do that. Even though Germany's not here, we still can't pass judgment on the conduct of Germany during the war. Um, and the State Department 
immediately and forcefully rejected that and said, no, no, no. Um, the US has a strong policy of providing for restitution for people whose property was taken by the Nazis. These principles of sovereign immunity don't apply to Nazi takings and suits, can go, suits should be able to go forward. Um, ha having received that announcement from the State Department, um, the Second Circuit ended up reversing and that case was permitted to go forward. At around the same time, the State Department announced this um, adoption of restrictive theory of sovereign immunity, meaning that states could generally be sued if their conduct was commercial in nature and not sovereign in nature. Um, so for a period of a couple of decades from like the 50s to the mid 70s, the way that the restrictive theory of sovereign immunity was applied was a foreign state would get sued in US court and the foreign state would then go to the State Department or to, an, to the US ambassador to their country or whatever and say, look, um, we just got sued in US court. We don't like this. We don't think it's appropriate. Sovereign immunity, um, State Department, please give a suggestion to the court that this case be dismissed based on sovereign immunity principles. And the State Department would then evaluate that on a case by case basis and make a suggestion to the court. And generally these suggestions were, were followed. Um, the State Department found this a very difficult position to be in um, because every single one of these was like a diplomatic issue. Um, and they preferred for both purposes of consistency and to remove themselves from sort of thorny diplomatic issues to say, you know what? Sovereign immunity determinations ought to be in the hands of the courts. They ought to make those determinations independent of any weighing in by the State Department in individual cases. And so that's what led to the adoption of this Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act in the mid seventies. And basically what it was, is it was an attempt to codify and it was batted around for like three years with expert testimony from international lawyers and State Department officials and people from justice and a lot of people. Um, was the idea was let's codify the existing principles of the restrictive theory of sovereign immunity, whereby countries, the sovereigns can be sued for their commercial conduct um, and codify it in a way that courts can now just apply this going forward. And so the provision of the Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act that is at issue in our case is the expropriation exception, which Ariel mentioned, uh, sorry, which Arthur mentioned earlier. Um, and it reads as follows. It says, a foreign state shall not be immune from the jurisdiction of the courts of the United States in any case in which rights and property taken in violation of international law are an issue and that property or any property exchanged for such property is present in the United States in connection with the commercial activity carried on in the United States by the foreign state or that property or any property exchanged for such property is owned or operated by an agency or instrumentality of the foreign state. And that agency or instrumentality is engaged in a commercial activity in the United States. So that's fairly wordy, although it's fairly standard statute. statute. Um, so I'll break that down a little bit. Um, the first point is that there's not going to be immunity where rights and property taken in violation of international law are an issue. And there won't be immunity there where, and this is the qualifier, where there is some sort of connection to the United States as specified. And that can either be that the property is in the United States or that it's owned by an instrumentality of the foreign state that engages in commercial activity in the United States. So dealing with the nexus issue first, because it's a little bit of a simpler issue to deal with in this case, perhaps, um, Germany actually got out of the Welkenschatz case, um, and that's not an appeal, um, because the Welkenschatz is not in the United States, and to sue a sovereign itself in the United States, the property has to be in the United States. And that's a clear principle of law, and so Germany is out. Now, the remaining defendant is the SPK which is the museum institution, the cultural institution, the cultural arm of the, um, of the government there that, that owns the, or that operates the museum where the Welfenschatz is housed. 
And that entity does business in the United States, including like marketing materials about the Belton shots. And so that entity is in the case on that basis. Now, the trickier issue is, is the provision that says in which rights and property taken in violation of international law are an issue. Now, um, the position that Germany has taken on this in the case, and this is a position that um, the US government has adopted in support of Germany, and this is a position that international law scholars have endorsed, is really what that means is when it talks about rights and property taken in violation of international law, it's talking about a term of art. So a plain reading of this might be rights and property taken in violation of international law. So property taken from Jews as part of a genocide would seem self-evidently to qualify, right? Their position is no, that's not right because when it talks about rights and property taken in violation of international law, it's talking about expropriation of, of property from foreign citizens, from, from, not from your own nationals, but from foreign citizens. And it's not talking about genocide or anything else. And our position was the opposite, um, that no, you should read this text in accord with its plain meaning. And also in accord with the longstanding policy of the United States to permit recovery of art stole or property stolen in the Holocaust, which, um, which the State Department endorsed at the same time that it was endorsing the restrictive theory of sovereign immunity. So that's the central issue that's before the court is the interpretation of that provision. We think it's a plain text kind of issue and that the plain text is consistent with, um, with the US policy to promote restitute Holocaust era restitution. And uh, members of Congress actually submitted an amicus brief alongside of us saying that, yes, we think that was the intent of Congress too. So we're hopeful, um, but that, that's the central statutory question. I'll turn it over. Thank you, David. And Steve, um, you're up. If you can, Steve is our, our president. Yes, thank you. Yes, thanks. Uh, first, let me say, uh, as president of the HLJ, uh, that I thank everyone who's participating today, but and mainly I want to thank everyone who worked on this project and worked on this brief, um, these briefs, I should say, uh, starting with Arthur Trialdi, who was a intrepid or intrepid leader <laughs> in this effort, uh, and everyone else who worked on the briefs. Um, we're very grateful uh, for all the time and effort. These are very time-consuming undertakings. Um, and secondly, I want to thank all the Michi who uh, joined us uh, on these briefs. Uh, so I just wanted to say that from the uh, AAJLJ. Um, so yes, I'm gonna talk briefly because I'd like to make sure there is time for a discussion of any questions you have. On this question of comedy, you've heard uh, several reference to it already, so I don't want to rehash what you've already heard, but basically it's a principle that <clears throat> that is really grounded in, uh, shall we say, foreign policy and foreign affairs. Um, that if at all possible, um, one sovereign state should not bring another sovereign state into that country uh, and to face uh, litigation or charges in that country or claims in that country. Uh, and if there are such claims, uh, they should be uh, pursued in the original country, whether it's Germany or Hungary, whatever. Um, and that's a long standing doctrine of, as I say, grounded really in foreign policy and foreign affairs. Um, so I'll go right to the issue of FISA though, because FISA um, precludes uh, as we know, uh, actions against foreign countries, uh, typical uh, uh, so sovereign immunity. Uh, but it has this uh, exception, this exception for, among other things, genocidal taking, basically exceptions based on the violation of international law. Um, and if you think about it, not so much in a purely legal sense, 
But it's clear that Congress's intention was to allow cases to allow people to bring cases against countries that had uh, violated international law and expropriated its expropriation exclusion expropriated property uh, from the uh, uh, petitioners or from the from the plaintiffs rather those bringing the claims. Um, so to allow a court to um, grant comedy or recognize comedy and to send these uh, plaintiffs back to the country where they, the, they came from would, I think on its face, you know, is a rejection of what Congress intended to achieve when it carved out the exception. Um, so, there, and there's two ways, I think Arthur referred to it and, and uh, others, uh, that there's two factors that you have to look at in terms of, of the question of comedy. Uh, first of all, as the, as the uh, Court of Appeals held, the FISA, FISA exception eliminates the possibility of uh, uh, granting comedy or finding comedy. Uh, but of course that would undermine what Congress intended to do. So that's our, that was our position, that's the position we supported, that's the Court of Appeals position. Um, the second is if a court does not affect uh, or recognize, or uh, uh, in this case, the Supreme Court does not recognize uh, that, or does not agree with that principle, let's say, that, because that should be the end of it, I think, uh, then we could look at what, what, what has been alluded to as the balancing test, or what is a balancing test, where a court balances the interests of um, the petition of the plaintiffs and the interest of the two countries. And, and, and we think in that those in both cases of Germany and Hungary, on a balancing uh, basis, the, uh, the, the Supreme Court should rule for the, uh, for the uh, respondents in these cases and against the petitioners. Uh, let me just take the case of Hungary, for example. Well, first of all, let, let me talk about Germany briefly. Germany, in addition to the reasons that have been suggested and, and the discussion that um, Rob gave and the others, these, um, these petitioners, I'm sorry, these plaintiffs did go to Germany, try to get uh, relief in Germany. Uh, they were already in those courts in Germany before the commission in Germany, the, the system that had been set up to uh, deal with these issues and they were denied relief. So the notion that you would now have to send, th that they should now go back and try again, uh, seems to defy credulity in my opinion, and, on, and weighs very heavily in the balancing side, in the balancing test to allow these cases to be heard uh, here in the United States. Secondly, on the facts, uh, you know, on the facts as well, we can, and this is discussed in our briefs, you can see that Germany has not handled these issues very well in terms of art takings and so forth. So uh, we, we think we, we, can win, we should win on that basis or the petition, I'm sorry, the respondents should win. And turning to Hungary, uh, Hungary has a really poor, a very poor, and that's understating it, uh, restitution history and system. There was no restitution at all uh, while it was a communist country. And then after it, uh, it became an independent country, independent from the Soviet Union, it still had a very poor system. And we, part of the research that we did was to speak to um, lawyers in uh, Hungary who have been involved in these cases. Uh, and uh, the recoveries are, are very, uh, are not at all consistent with what the losses were in the cases that have been adjudicated there. Um, and it's just a simply not a fair system. So um, there is no possibility in our opinion, uh, and we say this, that the, that the petitioner, uh, the respondents here, I'm sorry, would get a fair shake, if you want to call it that, in, uh, in Hungary. And I, our other, you know, we argue this, we put a lot of emphasis on this, I think, because, you know, the Supreme Court uh, often looks for what I would call factual base, factual uh, bases to, desire, to, to decide a case if 
if they can decide a case on that factual basis and avoid, say, dealing with a constitutional issue or dealing with a complex, um, legis uh, complex interpretation of legislation, uh, which may be precedential, if they can find a factual hook to hang it on, um, I think, uh, you know, they often do that, the court. You can think of, there's lots of examples. The Baker case, for example, from Colorado was one more recent one in the last couple of years. So, um, and that's why one of the reasons we stress the, uh, particularly in the Hungary case, we stress the inadequacy, if you will, of the, um, of the uh, system in Hungary and the unfairness of the system, system in Hungary. Uh, the plaintiffs sim uh, will simply not get justice in Hungary. And in terms of Germany, they've been there and they've done that. What's the point of sending them back to Germany again? Uh, so I think those are two really powerful <laughs> arguments or strong arguments, let's put it that way. Uh, besides the legal argument that FISA, the, that the, uh, that FISA itself in carving out this exception ex, uh, for expropriation did not intend that the court could still uh, grant immunity to the foreign country, you know, via comedy, by, by invoking comedy and sending the case back to that country. So um, I know there's a lot more to discuss, so I'll just stop at that point and we can open it up to further discussion and Q&A and so forth. Thank you. I'm going to do... Uh, I, yeah, okay. and Arthur. I'm going to talk about Arthur now. On, on Holocaust and genocide and the, uh, before we open it up. I want to start, thank uh, again the team that you've heard from. As you can tell, it's a great group. Uh, and, and thank Garson Siegel, Steinmetz, Fladgate, and Blank Rome as firms, which provided an enormous amount of support, both of yes. them, including but not limited to the talents of the four gentlemen that you've just heard from. And I, I want to just kind of bottom line things and, and focus on two points that were important to us. One is where Ariel started his conversation, which is focusing the court on the Holocaust. And what that meant for us was emphasizing the scale and making the court think about and hear the victims during their deliberations and, and, and come to terms with the crimes. This was important for two reasons. First, because there's so much US law on the subject of Holocaust restitution, and the defendants in these cases are really in a fundamental way asking the court to abdicate the United States role in that regard and ignore congressional statements of what US policy is and what is or isn't in our national interest in favor of a much narrower conception of it. But second, it's important because it's important to have it make sense to the justices as they read a point that David made exceptionally in our brief and I think today as well, about how restitution for Holocaust crimes first has been longstanding policy, second, assisted in developing US law on sovereign immunity, and third, was existing at the time of, that FSIA was passed so that maintaining existing practice as of the codification of the FSIA meant not recognizing immunity for Holocaust taking. And then on genocide, explaining why that all is legally relevant, because the facts, the scale of the crimes inform the understanding of the genocidal intent of those who did these specific takings and rebutting claims that were particularly made in the German case, that these are property takings. And so in some sense, they're different or not part of the genocide. The same people are carrying out at the same time against the same victims and everybody else in their ethnic group. And from a legal matter, I won't give you a long uh, genocide convention exegesis, but genocide includes the creation of conditions of life calculated to destroy a group. And in, in Hungary, it's really easy to see how takings that were done at the time of ghettoization, and then at the time of loading people on trains to Auschwitz, in the case of most of, our, uh, of these plaintiffs, were calculated to destroy the group, were part of the plan to, to destroy the group. And legally, the importance of what Rhonda and Alyssa talked to you about in the analysis in the historian's brief is helping see the taking in the Welfenschatz case, though it was a single taking, as part of the same already existing systematic attempt to create conditions of life where Jews uh, would be destroyed as a group in Germany. And we were able to note as well that a number of our federal courts have distinguished between genocide and even other very serious crimes like war crimes 
and crimes against humanity in evaluating whether there were causes of action and essentially say in the end, look, these are people who've been de constructively denationalized, people who were targeted for genocide because of their membership in a minority group in the countries that uh, are, are defendants in these cases, in one case a country, in the other case an institution. The statute in question has long recognized that people victimized in this specific conflict, statute in this question in, uh, in question has, was drafted in the context rather of long running policy to recognize that victims in this specific genocide have a right to restitution. And comedy is only appropriate where there's a domestic process where there isn't, which there isn't in this case. And it would be absurd in any event to send this type of victim back for a hearing in a domestic court. So that, that ties together kind of the soul of what we were trying to communicate to the court. Thanks to everybody for their contributions. And Alyssa, if you've got questions from people for the group that you've been pulling Arthur, together, great. Arthur, I wanted to add, if I could, one more point that I meant to refer to, and that is that, which we think is very telling. If you look at the briefs of the petitioners in both these cases, all of the cases they cite to support the idea of comedy under these conditions involve private defendants, not a government, not a state. Um, in, the, in our cases, in these cases, the, the defendant is the state. So we'd be sending, sending a case back to a country where the state, the defendant, is both the judge and the jury, if you will, as well as a party to the case. And I think we thought it was very telling that they, there wasn't a single case they could cite. And, and some of the cases they cited were the, under the alien tort statute, by the way, which is based on a, a different concept. Oh, yeah. So I just wanted to get that in. Thank you. Um, uh, very quickly, we have somebody on the oh, call. I'm not, I'm not on video, I'm just listening. On, on uh, Don Burris. Don, could you make your point that you've been texting me about in one minute about the Altman case? Altman, yes. Don, if you could unmute yourself. I want to respect everyone and not interfere. Um, I was co-counsel in the Altman case with Randy Schoenberg. And the Altman case, everyone knows, is the otherwise known as the Klimt case. And all the analyses I've heard are very, very good. I just wanted to take a minute and try to put the open case in context. I, we also did an amicus brief, which was designed in large part to make sure that the court doesn't come down with an absurd decision, which would narrow their major and only ruling on the Holocaust and looted art. So, that the, the Oldman case fits in there in terms of what's happening. Yeah. And um, I just wanted to mention that in passing. Um, and we're hopeful, again, uh, Stephen and David and the other people who made the good presentations. We're particularly hopeful. I'm, I'm friendly with Nick O'Donnell, who's the main lawyer in, in our case now. And uh, we're, we're hopeful that they don't take a step backward. And the only other thing I wanted, to, I don't mean to interject or anything else like that. I just wanted to add something on textualism because the plan and program of Nick is to try to convince the textualist Supreme Court justices that we're asking them to act literally as some of you have suggested and just don't overturn the careful decision of the Court of Appeal. Take it literally. This is the same thing as an absolute statement. The uh, FSIA means what it means. And anyway, I didn't mean to be long with it, but I, I just wanted to mention that. Okay, we've gone over time and we have been um, looking at the comments that have come in and we can probably answer just one of them. Um, I would like to say, if you are not on the list of the AAJLJ, if you heard about this separately, please email um, Alyssa whose email would have been on the Zoom info to get you in here and we will get you on the list. Um, I, I really, again, we're, we all have to um, go back to something else, but yes, Heidi asked a question. The United States um, and the State Department is not supporting this position. It is taking what we call the parade of horribles position 
among others, which is, no, we can't do this because otherwise every single person out there with a grievance is going to want to come into federal court. And without going into the issue of other terrible things that happen, there is something unique about genocide. That's why the United States has taken this role. That's why there are two or three laws, the Holocaust Education and, and uh, Recovery Act, the HVRA, which full escapes me, specifically to allow this type of case. Um, Alyssa, uh, do we have time? I'm sorry that we do not have time for one more. Um, we want to thank everybody for joining us. As you can tell, this was a group effort. Um, very exciting. D despite the fact that we were a group of eight or nine lawyers, everyone got along very well. I mean, any conversations were um, cordial and respectful and all about learning. So we hope to continue to do things like this. The case is actually in the Supreme Court on December 7th which I think is going to be um, very interesting. I'm hoping to take the day off just in case I get the chance to be invited to listen to that hearing. And Ironically, it's um, Pearl Harbor Day. I didn't know that, so yes. yes um, and if there's anything else from the other panelists before we wrap this up? Well, I'd like to say that uh, we might be able to, some, there were some questions that were submitted in, through the chat box. So I think we can make an effort and should make an effort to answer those questions through an email yeah. after, after this session, because we didn't want to run this much longer than an hour. But we will get back to you with our responses. And also, we are probably going to host something like this again through another, um, another group. So please keep us in mind if this is uh, something you wish to know about or if you have not read the cases, if you would like to. Thank you very much. Thanks to everyone. Thank you. Participated and again, thanks to the team. Fantastic team. <laughs> Who do we take on next? Okay. <laughs> Can't wait to do that. Thank you, everybody. Yeah. All right. Thank you, everybody. Good job. Good job. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I've saved the chat. Okay.